Okay, um, it's Stephanie with uh, The Patient Story, and I'm super excited to welcome Megs to our patient story interview today. Thanks so much for joining us. Of course, my pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. You know, before we get into it too much, um, can you tell us a short little thing about, about you, um, how old you are, where you grew up, I don't know, your favorite food? <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Megs. My full name is Magdalena, but I go by Megs just because it's easier. I live in Winnipeg, Canada, which is like a relatively small city in central Canada. I'm currently 23 years old. I work as a translator from French to English. That's like my nine to five job. Um, I'm a dog mom. I'm obsessed with my dog. And my favorite Oops, okay, so there was a little pause there. Um, so you said your favorite food and then it paused. What was that? Oh, my favorite food is pizza because I like all the different combinations that you can make with pizza. Perfect, I love that. Um, pizza's like a win-win all the time, so you can't go wrong with that. Comfort food, it's like celebration food, it's yeah. everything food. It's everything, um, couldn't agree more. Um, so we have a lot in common other than loving pizza. Um, I also had non-Hodgkin lymphoma and PMBCL and really want to um, you know, hear what you went through. So let's just dive right in. Um, can you tell us what were the first signs of something's wrong here, I need to, I need to figure something out. Um, well, I lived like a pretty, I don't wanna say extreme, but I lived like a really busy life I was doing an internship for my current job. I was working evenings and weekends as a server, working closing shifts. So anyone who works closing shifts know that they're very late nights. And I was really pushing myself. And I just remember in November, 2018, I was in the shower and I just like thought to myself, I was like, nothing's wrong. Like I can't feel that anything's wrong physically, but something's wrong. Like I just, I don't feel good, but I obviously couldn't pinpoint it. Um, and then I kind of like let that go. And then January I started getting like a few weird symptoms. Like I'd get these really bad or migraines like quite often, whereas I would usually only get them once every few months. Um, but again, I really thought nothing of it. It was like exam season. So it's like, okay, I'm probably just really stressed. Um, and then the, what really set it off was it was about beginning of February, 2019. Um, that week in particular in Winnipeg, it was minus 50 degrees Celsius. No idea what that is in Fahrenheit, so I can't even tell you. Um, and then I noticed that I had a really, really bad cough, but that's not really uncommon here, especially when it's that cold. And then I also had swelling in my left arm. And I thought that that was just for me like leaning on my office chair because that's what I did at work. So I figured I must have just like tweaked a nerve or like it was just like cutting off circulation. Um, but then I was at the gym and I noticed that it was just completely blue. It looked like a whole massive bruise and it didn't feel like a bruise. It just felt like tingling. So I went to a walk-in clinic the next day because I was like, this is not normal. Um, and she asked me all the questions and one of them was, does cancer run in your family? Which it did, unfortunately. Um, but there was not like, no, she didn't alarm me of anything. So I just kind of thought it was just one of the questions that she asked along with like the other questions. And she sent me for a blood test and an x-ray. And then it came back as there was inflammation in my lungs. So she's like, okay, it's probably like, lung some sort of a like a lung infection or something like that I'll give you antibiotics when you're done the antibiotics go <clears throat> sorry for a follow-up x-ray I did that I felt totally fine swelling went down um and I almost didn't go for the x-ray because I was like I feel totally fine like I'm good and then I went thankfully I did um the next day I got a really cryptic phone call from a hospital saying hey you have a ct scan tomorrow morning at 8 a.m or something and I was like I think you have the wrong number and they're like nope this is for you um so then I went to the ct scan I was like what's going on um and then the doctor called me the the one that I went to at the walk-in and was like hey there was a mass on your lung you have an appointment with a thoracic surgeon so a surgeon who works like neck and chest area and then he'll further explain what's going on so that was that wow <laughs> and then like a deep breath because it's so and it's so funny how you know there are these moments where it's like oh this is nothing i think people have those moments and thankfully something did prompt you to go get that x-ray mm -hmm. right um definitely trust your gut <laughs> yeah there's something telling you like okay look just just go anyway um so okay so you get all the way to this surgeon and i understand that you then underwent more um more tests or like more scans um eventually you would have a biopsy but first um can you can you explain what happened after you met the surgeon yeah so i again like 
was a little bit, I was like, okay, something's wrong, but like cancer was not top of mind. It was like, okay, maybe there's some sort of growth or assist or something. I don't know. So I kind of went in there by myself, all like jolly and happy. And I was like, okay, cool. Let's get this over with and go to work. And like right away, he sat me down and he was like the sweetest gentleman. He sat me down and looked me in the eye and like grabbed both my hands and was like, you have a pretty big mass on your right lung. And he's like, there's three possibilities and all three are cancers. So that right away was like, open my eyes. I was like, that is not what I was expecting to hear. And then at the time, my boyfriend who I live with was in Mexico with his friends. So it was just like, just a whole mess. And I remember I just started crying and I didn't even know what to do or think. And then he basically was, they wanted to do the biopsy that night, but I was like, well, I want him to be here. I want him to come home. I don't want to have someone else pick him up from the airport and tell him what happened. So we put it off for a few days until he got home, but that was basically it. And then the biopsy just confirmed the diagnosis. Wow. And I mean, that was obviously, first of all, we're trained not to think that it's cancer, right? It's like, it's everything, but don't go to Dr. Google, all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you walk us through how you were able to, so in that moment, I know you said you were crying. I mean, were you able to process it? And do you remember that first phone call to your boyfriend, to your family about the fact that cancer was brought up to you? Um, Yeah. So I basically just didn't go to work. I went home and I was just so numb. I literally sat on the couch, I think, and cried for the rest of the day. Um, I just really didn't. I was like, I can't believe that this is actually happening right now. Um, And I contacted a friend of mine that I went to high school with who had just finished fighting cancer, I think a couple months prior. And I was like, she's the only person that would honestly get it at this point. So I messaged her and I was like, I'm going through a scare right now. And she basically was like, whatever it is, like, I'll help you through it. Don't worry. Like, don't, you know, Google, don't think about things until you know what's going on because you're just going to cause yourself extra stress. Um, So I waited a few days. I didn't go to work. I just kind of sat there and now I'm at home crying and watching Netflix and eating ice cream and then I remember I had to go pick my boyfriend up from the airport and it was just probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life was show up be happy and then keep it together the whole ride home and then tell him and then basically they wanted me to go to the hospital the next morning so I couldn't even put it off I had to just pick him up from the airport sit him down on the couch and just like just tell him everything and it was so like from nowhere and it was yeah definitely very tough um and then for my parents I went over to their house and I kind of just walked in and was like I have something to tell you guys don't freak out but this is the situation they found a like a growth on my chest and then I just kind of have to get it figured out and we'll see what happens from there so I mean I want to ask you about if you have any sort of guidance for people who maybe are just uh, dealing with or about to get unfortunately diagnosed and are going to wonder um, how to break it to people because you know it's heavy it's heavy to absorb yourself and then for a lot of people it's a struggle to figure out um, how to tell other people so I don't know like do you have any tips on that or Uh, my only advice is don't rush it like do it when you're ready and do it when you fully are able to process it I know with things like my official diagnosis I waited to even tell family like my boyfriend was the only one who knew for a few days just because like I needed to like understand it and process it because it's really overwhelming and then you get so many questions and you don't even know the answers to these questions and it's just it's a very very overwhelming feeling And people right away jump to like, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And then you don't even know what to feel. So my only advice is just don't rush, like let yourself process it all first and then tell people. And you don't have to tell everyone. You can just tell who you want to tell, right? Absolutely. Okay. I really love that you brought it up that way because I think it's a message that people can't hear enough. It's almost like people and patients feel this responsibility, but like you said, you need to put yourself first Mm -hmm. in this situation. So I really love that. Um, Okay, so you've got this crazy, you know, it's the initial, it's not the official diagnosis. Um, Just walk us through, so the next morning you have to go to the hospital. Can you walk us through, you know, everything that sort of led up to the official diagnosis? And, you know, maybe as you talk about a scan or a biopsy, could you describe um, what it was like uh, to undergo that scan or biopsy in human way so people can understand, okay, I might be going through that. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so basically the biopsy, they asked us to come in and because it was considered an like emergency surgery, um, the operating room was all booked up, but they were like, we need to get this done as soon as we can. So they were like, you're going to come and we're just going to kind of wait in the hospital until we have an opening and put you in. So the next morning I went all scared and nervous, crying the whole way there because I was like, I don't know what's going on. Um, we ended up waiting in the hospital, my boyfriend and I, all day long. They didn't have any openings, so they sent us home. We came back the next day. And then they told us then that I had to stay the night because they were probably going to have a opening the next morning. And it was just like, anyone who stayed at the hospital knows it's like nerve wracking and just, yeah, I remember I couldn't sleep that night. And the next morning I woke up and it was a little scary for me because I'm really good with needles. I'm good with medical procedures. Like that's fine as long as I know what's happening. But for me, they kind of told me, you know, we just because where the tumor is, it's like under your rib cage on top of your lung. And there's just so many vital organs and stuff in this area that we don't know exactly where we're going to do the incision, exactly how big it is, how many incisions. So yeah, they basically were like, we don't really know what we're getting ourselves into until we cut you open. Um, as scary as that sounds. Um, but I mean, at that point, you kind of say like, do whatever you have to do. Um, and yeah, they wheeled me in. And I just remember I was like, so nervous but you just kind of have to let go and trust that you're in good hands that everything will be okay luckily it went really well i have a small incision right here on my chest you can kind of see um that was their first try and they were able to get whatever they got from there um and it was good i stayed in the hospital for a few hours and then after i caught up and ate they let me go home for the rest of the night got nice painkillers to help me through um I think recovery was also pretty tough just because you don't really think about it, but in this area, like it affects your arm, it affects your chest, it affects your abdomen and I couldn't really move around. So the recovery was tough. I couldn't do a lot. Um, it took me probably about two weeks, I would say to feel better. Um, just like a lot of taking it easy. No, like using my right arm, but I mean, other than that, like obviously it's what had to be done. So so yeah, you, you power through, you do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, the timeline you sent me, it looks like it took a little while um, to actually get the official diagnosis after the biopsy. Um, first, can you describe the wait, I guess, at home? I don't know if it was that you were waiting for a call. I don't know how you got your diagnosis, diagnosis if it was in person or over the phone or whatever, but yeah, describe that wait first at home and then maybe lead us up to um, or through when you got officially diagnosed. Yeah, so it was about, I think, a two-week period, which is actually a really long time for biopsy results. I'm not sure why that happened, but um, yeah, it was nerve-wracking. I think a lot of it was distraction because I was in pain, so I kind of just let myself I tried to relax. I tried to help let myself heal. My objective was to have the smallest scar possible. So I was really trying not to overdo it. Um, and then I remember I went back to work and I just kind of tried to keep my mind occupied. Um, I feel like I can't exactly remember, but I feel like I had already accepted that it was probably cancer at that point. I'm just like one of those people where I'm just like, okay, like I accept it and let's move on and get it over with. So that's I'm that's from what I remember that's how I thought um and I was just waiting for a phone call from the surgeon basically that's what I was waiting for and I was sitting at work one day and his nurse called me and said hey we need you to come in for the results I left work right away and um unfortunately but not really um the oncologist's office called as I was driving to the uh, appointment and of course we all know what an oncologist is so I guess it kind of ripped the band-aid off I don't know because I feel like I would have had really bad anxiety sitting in a waiting room waiting so maybe just because like there was a blessing in disguise that it was just so out of the blue but I mean as soon as they called she's like oh, we're setting up an appointment for you to meet with your oncologist and then I knew that it was cancer I didn't know the details but I mean cancer is the only thing I needed to know at that point um yeah, and then I went to the surgeon, he told me again, and gave me a little bit more details, and just told me you have to meet with the oncologist, and they'll help you out. Ooh, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, okay, so I do like that you looked at the silver lining, right, which is, well, it's really uncomfortable in the waiting room, and might as well rip the bandit off, you know, the way you described it. Um, I guess, one, um, what were those details like at that point what what did they know about what kind of cancer like did they know the subtype the stage and all of that and they tell you that um, or was it just more like oh you have lymphoma now we'll have to do more 
Well, the way he put it is he was like, I'm not a specialist, so I don't want to give you wrong information. So he's like, you have lymphoma. The tumor is X by X size. It's located in exactly this area. Um, that's about all the information he gave me. Um, and then I decided to be a little sneaky. Um, I had bandaging on my um, scar, but the scar was too big for regular band-aids. So I asked the nurse to get me like more hospital band-aids so I could cover it up. And they left the room and I saw that they had a paper <laughs> and I took a picture of the paper. And that paper had um, not official, but like they thought it was primary mediastinal large knee cell lymphoma and a few more like scientific -y medical terms on it that I didn't really know later googled but I kind of yeah had to figure it out on my own yeah and it's it's your data so that's mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm glad you sort of took it into your own hands at that moment as a patient as a former patient um I totally understand yeah, yeah. um most want to know yeah I mean and it's it's like you said it's it's better to just have a plan or have more information so you can move forward um mm -hmm. for a lot of people anyway um so at that point, do you know how they referred you to that oncologist? And had you ever considered, oh, I don't want to go to this oncologist. I'm going to get a second opinion or, you know. Um, well, they just, I mean, they referred me. So I'm assuming, I don't know if it's like the one that he thinks is the best, like the thoracic surgeon, or if that's just who they go to automatically. I have no idea. Um, I just, I really, I guess, trusted the system. I trusted because we have a really good cancer research center here in Winnipeg. And I just, I know the doctors are good. So I trusted them. Um, I didn't even want to go on like those rate my doctor sites because I was like, I like, I know that there's going to be bad, there's going to be good. And it's like, I, ha I knew nothing about oncologists about that region of health or anything so I was like who am I to try to do my own research and stress myself out even more when I honestly have not the slightest clue right, right. It, it, they're part of the same system then they're part of the same hospital system yeah so in Winnipeg uh, it's because it's a smaller city basically all the hospitals work under one system I guess so gotcha Okay, very good. Um, so can you describe, I guess, let's see, so you got the diagnosis March 15th, and then it says you underwent a series of more scans. Was that after you met with the oncologist, um, or had you not even met the oncologist? Um, so I had a scan the morning, like right before I met the oncologist. So I had the MUGA scan for the heart, just to see how my heart was doing and whether there was any blockage to like the blood in my heart. Um, and then after I had met with her, there was a whole initial appointment of, you know, this drug is going to do this to you. This drug is going to do this. This is what's happening. And then after that, I think I had, yeah, a CT scan and then some, a PET scan. PET scan. Can you describe, actually, this is the first time I've seen the MUGA scan. Um, can you describe each of those scans? You know, it doesn't have to be long, but just enough where you would like to tell Megs too from before. Oh, here, this is what you're going to go through. Yeah. So uh, CT scan is the easiest. <laughs> um but also probably the most uncomfortable. So it's just like one of those big donut tubes. You go in, you go out a few times, you hold your breath a few times. Um, they gave me this thing called contrast. So I've seen some people have to drink something. I never had to drink anything. I just get this IV contrast, which is basically like, honestly, I don't even know. It's something that like shows it better in your body. And when they put it through, it gives you this sensation of a hot flash from head to toe and you feel like you just peed yourself. You never do, but it's the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. So that's that scan. It's super quick. It usually is only like 15 minutes. Um, PET scan is basically like a more detailed version, specifically, I think, for cancer cells. I'm not sure if they use it for other things. Um, same kind of thing. They put like this radioactive sugar into your uh, blood. And because cancer cells love glucose, they attach and it lights up exactly where there's cancer in the body. So that's usually the scan that people will have throughout their treatment just to see if the tumors are shrinking or the cancer is and stuff like that. That one's a little longer. It's about, I'd say an hour, hour and a half because you have to wait for the sugar to go through your body. And then you go in the donut shaped machine for like 20 ish minutes. And then MAGA scan, it might be a different um, name in the United States, but it's basically, they just check your heart how your heart's working, how your heart's beating, and then they kind of check after chemo to see if there's been any damage. And the chemo that I was on specifically could have affected my heart, so that's why they just kind of wanted to know what they were starting with and then what the end result would be. Gotcha, you described it so well, so that was super succinct, I love it. Um, so I know you start chemo a few days after your last scan there. Um, after the scans, do you remember when you got the results? And 
uh, at what point did the, did the oncologist then say, okay, here are more details about what we're dealing with? Um, basically, the way she put it is we already know what the diagnosis is, we know what the staging is. Before we start, we just want to make sure that we have all the possible information. So she's like, I just want to do one last MAGA scan, one last CT scan to see if it has grown, to see how like um, aggressive it is from the first one, which was like a couple weeks before, I think. So that was just her. She just wanted the best understanding possible. And then they basically called me and were like, hey, you're starting chemo on Wednesday. So. <laughs> like everything else that's happened with this so far for you it's just like da -da 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 -da, like a not phone call and they're like you know hey you're gonna start chemo Wednesday get ready I'm like, yeah no big deal just yeah <laughs> um <laughs> oh my gosh um it's, it's interesting right like to kind of retell it because in the moment it's just happening but then telling the story it's like wow this is a lot, it's that... a lot within the span of a month yeah um so, by the way, can you describe uh, what you remember of how the oncologist described what exactly you were dealing with? Like, okay, it's stage, I think you said four, mm -hmm. um, and explain why, and then um, describe the chemo that, and the treatment that she said was, was good for, for you. Yeah, um, I mean, from what I remember, like most people, I was honestly probably very numb, and I just kind of like, I didn't even cry. I just kind of like let all the information come and absorbed it as much as I could. Um, luckily, I had my boyfriend there who was a second set of ears because I honestly didn't remember everything, but I mean, she couldn't give me too many, I guess, details, but basically it was like, same thing, like this is the exact type, so primary metastinal large B-cell lymphoma, there is a tumor on your chest that's X and X size. Um, I was getting a little bit of cancer cells lighting up in my neck, so she said that it was spreading to my neck, which is why we needed to start treatment as soon as we could. Um, and then, yeah, she gave me basically two options for chemo and was like, well, which one would you like? And I kind of was like, I honestly, don't know I trust your judgment because like I don't want even want to look into this because it's going to be even more stressful for me so she said okay let's go with this one which was our trap and then she gave me a booklet with all the information about the chemo regimen and the drugs and then basically just kind of summarized it like this drug does this and this is how the side effects this drug does this this is the side effects this is the red devil this is the one that makes your hair fall out da 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 um, and then just kind of walked me through everything, how the sessions were going to look, asked me if I wanted a pick or a port, or if I just wanted to do IV. I chose to do IV, and what like an average chemo day would look like, how the first session was going to be different from the rest, and then pretty much we just talked about the whole like possibility with not being able to have children, possibility of menopause, other potential side effects that could have happened, and yeah, that was a, that's about it that I remember from that appointment. Wow, that's very comprehensive. Um, and I'm kind of impressed that it was all covered in that one sort of setting, especially that she brought up the fertility preservation because a lot of times uh, patients are having to bring that up themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Before we move on, so one, you mentioned a great tip, which was having another set of eyes and ears in the room. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that or if you have any other sort of tips um, for people up until this point about what might be helpful, especially when it's so overwhelming. Yeah, um, so yeah, either have another set of ears and eyes in the room. Um, I, I mean, I don't know how this sounds, but someone who's not emotional, because it would be really hard if you're trying to keep it together, but the person next to you is like crying or is freaking out because that just makes it harder on you. And luckily my boyfriend's like super strong. So he was there and just like holding my hand through it all. But somebody who you know will be there to help you out to remember that you trust, obviously, with all this information. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, otherwise, I would say record it. Um, taking notes is probably not the smartest because you're trying to like think and remember and write stuff down. But if your oncologist is okay with it, ask if they could record the whole appointment. Um, I know there's also apps that like will record and transcribe. So you can do stuff like that as well. But definitely to help you just, yeah, remember because there's just so much information being thrown at you that you're not going to be able to absorb it all or ask if they have any like booklets or information that you could also read afterwards. Great advice. Um, and I, I actually did do the recording thing too, because it just feels nice, I think, peace of mind that, okay, if anything, we can always go back to the actual transcription of what the doctor said. Um, you also brought up the decision about IV versus PIC versus port. Can you talk about why you decided IV and um, if you have any, not regrets, but thoughts about the decision that you made? Mm -hmm. So I know it's not an option for everyone. Um, it was for me only because I think I was only like 
they thought I was only going to have six sessions, which like, and it was only going to be a few hours at a time. So it wasn't like I was in the hospital like constantly for a week at a time, like some chemo regimens. So they did basically walk me through like the ups and downs of everything. Um, pick I didn't want because I'm a relatively active person. So I was just worried that I would affect it. I would hurt myself. I would rip it out. I just was kind of scared of the idea of having it there. Um, port, I mean, it sounds shallow, but I was already very, very self-conscious of the scar I had on one side, so I didn't want another scar on the other side. Um, and then, so I just opted for um, doing IV, and I knew that there was obviously risks associated to that, but I was willing to take my chances. And did the IV work out okay for you? Yeah, it did. Um, had trouble with veins sometimes, but I mean, I feel like at some point everyone has trouble where the veins decide that they don't want to cooperate with you that day, but it's okay. I'm good with needles. <laughs> I, okay, so um, before we jump into the chemo part of it, you did touch on this already, Megs, which is, you know, the breaking the news part. Um, I know that when it was the preliminary diagnosis, you had already kind of gone through it. When you officially got the diagnosis, you said you'd waited a few days to process yourself, and then you told family. Do you have any tips for people on, on how to sort of bear that <laughs> part of it? Yeah, um... I'm not a very like emotional person, but my family is. So I kind of just took the approach of like, I told them like the bare necessities. I told them all the facts that they needed to know without getting into too much of detail. I told them what the plan moving forward was. And I was like, I'm gonna be okay. Anything serious, I'll update you with. But I just didn't wanna get too into it because it would scare them. And then I knew their reactions would affect me. So when I had all the information, when I was ready, when I got the crying out of my system, I again went over to my parents' house and was like, okay, this is what it's called. This is the staging. This is what we're going to do. My chemos are going to be like X and X and this and this, and this is what's going to happen and I'll be fine. And that's what I did. Did you, um, did you decide to be private about the cancer situation or did you, I know some people like will post it on social or just to kind of let people know. Well, at first, um, my idea was I was just going to kind of dis disappear under the radar. I was going to just disappear for a few months and then come back. Um, but then I got this idea to put it on YouTube. I was like, what if I did that? Because when I first got my diagnosis, obviously I had no idea what lymphoma was. I didn't even know what chemo looked like. All I knew is that you lost your hair. So I would go on YouTube. I would go on Instagram and I couldn't find a lot about it. Um, there was a few Instagram profiles that I found. There was a few YouTube, but it was a lot more about either pediatric cancer or older people going through cancer or doctors talking about cancer. But there was nothing really of young people that I could really relate to. And I was like, this is really what I need. And at the time, I wasn't aware how many young people are affected by cancer. You always associate it with either like something that older people get or little kids get, but you never think about it in your like young adult years. And I kind of had this idea, but I was kind of like, eh, I don't know anything about videos or recording. And I was driving with my boyfriend in the car a few days before I started my treatment. And he was like, why don't you like take advantage of the fact that you're going to have time off. You're going to be able to occupy your time with either putting it on YouTube or like writing a book or doing something to like share your experience and also keep you busy. So you're not sitting at home and it's stuck in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the push that I needed. The idea was already there. I just needed a push. So then I decided to do the complete opposite of going under the radar and put it on Instagram, put it on YouTube and kind of stuck with it until this day. Wow, that's amazing. And we'll make sure to talk about that at the end of, of our chat. But um, it is interesting, right, what you'll do in that moment. I'm a very private person, even though I used to be a reporter and people would be like, oh, that means you're very public. No, I was like incredibly private, but I decided to just post it on Facebook and then blog, which is like something I would have never guessed. Just like for you, you were like, I'm going to fly under the radar. Actually, I'm just going to just going to share with the world everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I also thought that was good because you don't have to separately give everyone updates you kind of do it all at once and it's less painful I found for myself 100 percent. that was a benefit that I hadn't planned for but I agree it's like you you can update people um in one place and you're not getting bombarded by questions constantly so for people who are interested I think that's a great point um so you start chemo very quickly because you got the call and they're like all right Wednesday's the day we're gonna go in um can you describe that first day and I know there's a process of it's not just getting the infusion it's like getting your blood labs to make sure your levels are okay can you can you walk us through the process mm -hmm. um 
yeah, so I went to the hospital, I got the blood work done, and they split my first one into two days, just because they didn't want to overwhelm my body, so I went one afternoon, I think I got three out of the six, so I got, um, or three out of the five, and then that one I didn't really have any side effects from, I just remember being all chipper and sitting in the chemo room and everyone's kind of looking at me like why is this girl so happy and I was just like let's just get this over with like this is what I have to do now let's just do it my boyfriend was there we were vlogging and we were just having a good time and luckily the nurses at the hospital that I was at were all super like happy-go-lucky joking around and that's like what you need I think nurses are if there's a happy nurse that just makes all the difference and yeah so she was like telling me what was going to happen but also making jokes and making conversation and it was just like so chill I want to say like I didn't really even feel like I was getting chemo um went home that night and I just felt like the sinus like the weird you know you feel like your head's just clogged up um and then the next morning I woke up and then I had my little prednisone mood face and it was yes yeah, so and went to the hospital and then that's when I got I don't remember which exact drug it was but the one that you can potentially get allergic reactions to so they wanted to administer it to me slowly first because they wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to get a reaction to it and that was like a whole eight hour infusion and that was yeah my first one so I remember the side effects were not that great and I obviously hadn't had my tips to manage them yet um but eventually <laughs> I figured okay. it out yeah, eventually you figure it out. Um, I do want to, you know, talk about what helped you. So maybe it'll help other people. Um, but actually, so overall, can you describe, so it was usually, I know that one was broken up into two just to help because of your first one, but normally it would be one, you'd go in like on a Wednesday, get an in, the infusions all in that one day, mm -hmm. and then it would be two weeks and then you'd go again or would it be three weeks or it was three weeks so yeah I would go in usually in the morning at around nine and I'd probably leave at around two um so yeah they were able to give me the infusions in larger doses I guess or quicker um as I got along and if my bloods were okay so yeah nine to two and then three weeks so it took me about a week to recover and then the two weeks I'd feel okay and then another infusion and how many overall did you have you said six Okay, so let's walk through the fun part, which is the side effects, and then also the, the side effects of the medications for the side effects. Um, it's all fun. Um, what did you feel? So first of all, I guess, when would you start to feel the side effects usually out of these six cycles? Um, what were they? And then eventually, if you could give us the best tips for what helped prevent them or lessen the effects of them. Yeah, so... Um usually that evening I'd still feel pretty okay um the next morning is usually when everything hit I had a really bad nausea and I was very sensitive to smells so for the longest time we couldn't cook anything that had any sort of a smell because I would just get so sick and I wouldn't be able to look at that food forever and then I don't know if this is common but for me the first meal that I would eat after treatment when I would get nauseous, it's like my brain would associate the nausea from that meal. So I couldn't even look at like hot dogs or anything for a very long time if I had one right after treatment. But that, um, I got really bad headaches all the time from the chemo. I uh, had mouth sores for a little bit. Those were absolutely terrible. Um, I would get like numbness uh, as well. Um, I think that's it for like the really bad ones that I could remember. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of like smaller ones. I remember my stomach started getting like super like acid reflux and stuff. So I had to get different medications for those. But um, as far as like how I treated things, so I did get medications from the hospital for nausea, but I did find out they didn't really help me. What did help me was ginger. So I would take ginger pills or drink ginger tea. That really helped me. Um, also just snacking on foods that were small portions. I found that if I got myself to be full, then I would get even more sick from it. So I would just do like smaller snacks throughout the day just to keep my stomach, like there's something in my stomach, but I'm not necessarily full. And it was just like a lot of like crackers, um, bagels, popcorn, like anything that was carby that could like help me feel full, but that didn't necessarily have a smell. Um, for the headaches, I tried like a million different things. I really didn't want to take T3s or any strong drugs because to me, I was like, I'm already on too many drugs. I don't want to take any more unless it's absolutely necessary. So I would do like cold baths or hot baths, depending on how I was feeling. I always had like a wet towel on my head. Um, I'd even tried using essential oils to help with like the headaches. Um, yeah, like just being quiet, like, taking lots of naps. 
And then for the mouth sores, I had to get prescription because there was nothing that could help without a prescription. Those can be the worst. Mm -hmm. I, I only got mouth sores my first cycle, um, but they were like, there were like dozens of them <laughs> all over. And I, it, oh, I remember trying to eat and I was just bawling my eyes out because I was so hungry, but even closing my mouth hurt so much. It's terrible. It's bad. I got to the point where I had to drink like in those smoothies, you know, just to get calories in, but even those were painful. Um, I don't know if this helps for everyone, but a cyclovir helped me eventually. Like yeah. after I took that, then I didn't have mouth sores anymore. And it was one of those things where my doctor hadn't even told me it was a possibility to help prevent. And I was like, oh, this would have been so key. Yeah. So that's why I'm glad you're talking about things that did help you. Everyone has a different, you know, they track differently, but it's good to know what the options are, right? On the topic of mouth sores, someone did tell me after I finished chemo that apparently if you chew on ice while you're getting your injections, that helps somehow. Yeah. So I know lots of people would just bring ice and I never tried it, but I mean, it's worth trying to avoid mouth sores. hundred percent. And you know what? I, I actually, now you just um, triggered my memory. I heard the same thing. So I think, you know, part of this too is again, nobody like tracks the same exactly. Right. So what helps you might not help me, might not help somebody else, but I don't know about you. It's the feeling of some sense of control that I think I wanted, which was, I can't control how my body reacts to this. But if I have more information about what I can use to help prevent or take some of that control back, it was just really powerful for me. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, and like even the whole placebo effect thing, like maybe if it's not really doing something, but in my mind, I'm like, this will help me automatically, that could also help, right? So it was definitely nice. I definitely had like my whole like to-do list of like what to do when this happens and this happens. I actually have a video on it on YouTube as well. So for anyone who wants more, they can look at that video. Awesome. Awesome. We'll, we'll make sure to drop the links. Um, so I'd like to talk about obviously one of the worst side effects of it all, which is hair loss. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, I know you had actually a really specific date. I appreciate it. It was April 10th when you said you started noticing really the hair falling. Can you describe what that was? And then I know there were six days until you decided to cut your hair or shave your head. Um, so yeah, what led to that? Uh, yeah, so I had it, it was exactly two weeks to the day after my first chemo. And I remember like talking to a friend and they were like, oh, well, have you started losing hair yet? And I was like, no, like, this is awesome. Like all my hair is still here. I feel great. Like my next chemo is in a week and I still haven't lost any hair. This is awesome. And then the next morning I was just like sitting on my computer working from home and I was kind of like had my hands in my hair and I just pulled out like a clump and I was like, oh no, here we go. So I went to the bathroom and of course did the whole like, woo. And uh, yeah, a bunch of hair came out. It wasn't crazy at first. It was just like a few, like five hairs at a time, which still is a big deal when you're losing your hair. Um, and I just kind of left it and I was like, you know what? I'm going to just hold on to it as long as I can. Next morning, it was all over my hoodie. And then I think like two more days after that, it was just everywhere. It was unbearable. I would literally be outside in the wind and you would just see hair coming out. And so then I called, I was like, I need to get rid of this because at that point, it's just more painful watching your hair fall out. For me, it was just mentally harder just to see blonde hair everywhere and keep vacuuming. And I had really long blonde hair. Um, I did end up cutting it to my shoulders um, for a bit. And then just to kind of see what it would look like, just because I always wanted shoulder length hair. So I was like, might as well, it's going to fall out. I also dyed my hair gray because I was like, oh, why not? It's, I don't care about damage at this point. And yeah, and then after about six days, I had to take it all off. And then by the time I went to see the hairdresser who shaved my head, I already had bald patches on both sides. And right over the top, there was a nice big bald patch. So it looked pretty sad. <laughs> You know, I like that you decided to take the opportunity to experiment. Now, again, everyone's different in the way they handle it. I was like you and I'd shaved half of my head. I was like, oh, I wonder what that would look like. Because I would never do that, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for you, was that just empowering? And then, you know, um, and then I do want to ask your decision to go to a hairdresser as opposed to, say, having your boyfriend or parents shave it at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was someone that ironically really cared about their hair and really cared to have healthy, strong hair. So I tried to, you know, minimal heat, all the nice products, and I had really nice long hair. So I never dyed it because I was like, A, I don't know if it's going to look good, B, I don't want to damage my hair. But after you know that it's going to fall out anyways, you're like, what does it even matter at this point? So that's when I decided it was between pink and gray, but I wanted to try gray out. <laughs> um, so we did that. and It was like at home. So it was so funny. It was me and my boyfriend. We did it together. And it was just kind of like a fun memory. And 
yeah and then for as far as the hairdresser goes um so the girl that I had contacted when I first got my scare um she went through it and basically there's this wig center here in Winnipeg where they give wigs to people who either lose their hair to chemo or who um, have hair loss and stuff like that. And they also offer the service when you get a wig that they will shave your hair for you and tell you how to properly care for your scalp and kind of walk you through what it's going to look like. And the lady has a lot of experience who did it. So I decided just to go to her because I figured like she knew what she was doing. Um, and it's hard to ask somebody to do it too and stuff like that. So yeah. How did you feel when you had the hair finally getting like buzzed off, shaved off? What feeling was that for you? I was worried that I was going to cry. I thought it was going to be a hot mess, but I don't know. I got there and I was like, this is the next step. This is what I have to do. Let's do it. And I just sat there and we were just having normal conversation while she was shaving all my hair off. And then I looked at myself and I thought it looked pretty cute, honestly. Like, so I was like, okay, this isn't that bad. She didn't shave it completely. She did leave about um, an inch of hair just to let it fall out on its own to prevent ingrown. So I had like a buzz cut essentially with a few bald patches, but yeah, I felt like honestly empowered. And I was like, you know what? Like, let's just do this. Like, this is the next step let's keep going. You're like, I have a nice looking head. This is all good. <laughs> you have so, such a cute little shape. And I was like, oh, thank you. That's good to know. Like, it's an odd compliment, right? But you're like, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I have so many questions actually following that, but um, any tips for people? So like you, you did end up getting wigs, I guess. I know. Um, mm -hmm. So personally, like I, I didn't like the wig. It was itchy for me, even though I try to get a nice one and, and whatever. Um, people were beanies and caps, hair attached to caps. Like what, what worked for you? What advice do you have for folks? So the first wig that I got was from that wig salon. Um, when I did get it though, it was, I got the call, you're starting chemo on Wednesday. And I knew that hair falls out right after chemo. I didn't know exactly how many days I had. And I knew that you had like for this clinic or for this um, wig salon, you had to order them and it took two to three weeks. And I was like, oh no, I need a wig as soon as my hair falls out because like, I don't, you know, I was just scared of the fact that I would be bald because who wouldn't be? Um, so I kind of went and I, like, I didn't do research. I didn't know much about wigs. I kind of just got the first wig that I saw, which I mean, it's hard because like, I can't say take your time because some people like me don't have time. Um, I did, you know, had, if I'd gone back, I would have done more research because it did pay a whole lot of money for it. Um, and it wasn't necessarily, I'm not going to say it wasn't the right wig for me, but you know, it just didn't feel like me. And I could have probably gotten something that made me a little more comfortable at first, but I decided to get a human hair wig just because I knew I was going to wear it a lot. And I knew that it was um, going to last me and look more natural. And I was just, I just really wanted to look natural. And then I got a few beanies and I also got the cap with the hair. That one had synthetic hair on it, but just convenient for like going out or going to the grocery store or just like when you want to wear a hat. Um, yeah, and then I ended up getting more wigs, and then I ended up finding a few months later a wig that was perfect for me, but it definitely did take researching, looking into it, and stuff like that. Okay, thanks for walking us through that, because um, I know hair is just such a big topic for a lot of people. Um, so I know that um, you, you stopped work, it says, at the end of April, so this wasn't something where you felt like, oh, I can just power through it, right? I mean, you were like, I need to take a break. Initially, I wanted to. I asked my oncologist what she thought, and she was like, most of my patients that are on this chemo regimen don't go to work anymore just because it is pretty intense. She said, you can do what you want. You know, I'll give you a note and just submit it as soon as you feel the need to. Initially, I wanted to work through it. Um, <clears throat> my job said that I could work from home. So I was like, okay, this is fine. Um, after my first round of chemo, I did return to work, and I just found it to be really hard. I couldn't concentrate, and being a translator, you need to be on your game. You need to provide good quality. Quality, and I just knew that I wouldn't be able to give them the best quality work. I didn't want that to affect my future if I wanted to work there. I also wanted to be able to recover and take a nap whenever I wanted to. So I just have figured that it was the best situation for everyone if I just took time off. Any other uh, tips for people about, about that, I guess, in terms of just our job and the intensity and, and how to take it easy or not? <laughs> It, yeah, it's a very intense um, 
adjustment, especially I went from living a very, very active lifestyle to essentially being couch bound for a very long time. So it is a huge adjustment. And for me, like it was again, like emotionally, it was really hard to make that adjustment when you're used to having plans and always having something to do and somewhere to go to laying on your couch and staring at the ceiling. Um, I would say like try it out if you want to work and you think you can like if your job isn't physical obviously if your job's physical and if you have to leave the house and have the chance of getting exposed because you really can't get sick when you're on chemo that's probably the biggest thing is just trying not to get any germs and get sick so if you have the possibility to avoid that definitely try it out if you think that you can make it work but I feel like talking to your employer is just the most important part letting them know what's going on because just like you didn't know about cancer before you got it, they won't know what you're talking about either. So definitely talk to them, try to work out a plan if you can, right. and just kind of do with what you feel is right. Right, right. That's like the ultimate message here is do, is do you, essentially. Um, yeah. So as we wrap up the chemo, did you get a scan in the middle of your chemo cycles and then one at the end? I know that's pretty typical. And if so, what did those show? Yeah, so I got a scan after my fourth cycle of chemo that basically showed that there was nothing in my neck anymore and the tumor had significantly shrunk. So it had shrunk to about one third of the size. So they were like, okay, so we have one third of the chemo left, one third of the size, this is looking really good. Um, and they said, we're going to continue with chemo, do another scan after that, and then we'll see. Radiation was on the table, but it wasn't like a for sure. It was just like a maybe we'll see. So yeah, and then I did the last two cycles and that after showed that there was still some type of, not activity necessarily, but they weren't sure if it was inflammation or if it was um, still active cancer cells. So then we did wait for a little bit. I got another scan again a few months after that. It showed that the activity was going down. So we think they're like, oh, we think it's just inflammation. Um, anyways, we're going to keep an eye on you for the next few years. So if anything comes up, we can do radiation. Essentially, it was my choice at the end of the day, but I was, didn't really want radiation because I just didn't want more treatment. I didn't want to affect my body even more than it already was. So I just was like, okay, if I ever need it, I'll get it. But at the moment, let's just kind of keep monitoring with scans and... Awesome. And so the, so it's great news really, um, because the trend is exactly what they're looking for. And mm -hmm. your follow-up so far has been, you said PET scans every three months for a little bit, not anymore. Now it's just uh, blood work and seeing your oncologist every few months. Yeah. yeah. So the last, I had, I think two more PET scans after that and they all showed like slightly decreasing, decreasing. So that just means that Every, it's probably inflammation just all going down slowly, which is pretty common that there's still like some sort of scar tissue there, obviously where the tumor was. And then we just decided that, yeah, we're just going to do blood work from now on. And then if I have symptoms or if I'm not feeling good or if I want to scan, I can get one. But as of right now, exposing me to that extra scan radiation is not necessary. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And so did they ever give you the official, well, you're in remission for now talk? Or was it always like a, well, watch and wait? Um, so I got it from a radiologist. Um, my oncologist never told me the word remission. So I was always kind of like, okay, I don't know. I don't know. But um, when I talked to the radiologist, because I had a meeting with him anyways, just to kind of talk over what I was thinking, what he was thinking. Um, we both decided not to do it at the moment. But he basically was like, you've been in remission since your last chemo. And I was like, oh, no one ever told me. So um, my like remission day is the day that I found it out from him, whereas it's actually a few months before. But that, that's the day I found out and that's the day that I felt like I could take a deep breath so that's kind of the day that I count for my remission day. So interesting that I mean it's kind of like how could you how was that missed I guess you know because that's like a very important thing right for anyone to hear. I know maybe some doctors want to be cautious but um, yeah how did you process that at the end because you go through all this and then I think my oncologist just didn't want me to be like, okay, I'm done. This is good. I think she wanted me to consider my options of doing radiation or of not doing radiation and monitoring. So I think maybe that's also why. Um, but I just cried tears of joy. I was like, I feel, and I had this feeling in my gut that holding off on radiation was the right decision to make. And then I think the radiologist confirming that just made me feel like I was doing the right choice. And I was like, you know what, finally, this is over I get to start slowly going back to work I get to slowly start having my life back and like I just remember it was such a good day and I just I think I cried the whole evening out of joy and I was like life is good like let's you know get back to normal so so glad that you finally got that news um for a lot of people and I don't know if this, is, if this applies to you but it's uh 
it's, it's the start of a whole nother thing, you know, so it's great. You go through treatment. Um, by the way, before we move on, the support that you got, did you feel that you got enough of it? I know that you're very close to your boyfriend and that you have parents around. Um, but I think that's a whole nother topic is how to ask for help and what kind of support is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm one of those people that says, if I can do it myself, I'm just going to do it myself, which is a lesson that I did learn that I really did lean on my boyfriend a lot. And um, he was like my caretaker and I owe him the world for doing all of that for me. Um, I had a really good group of friends that would also come and check in on me. Um, overall support was really good as well. Obviously from social media and stuff like that, it was really helpful. It was also very helpful to connect with other people who had um, primary mediastinal or cell lymphoma because you know, it's more on the rare side for lymphomas. So that was also really good support, being able to ask questions to people who are already in remission and stuff like that. So yeah, overall, I'd say that although overwhelming at times, I did have pretty good support. And do you have any tips on how to ask for the support? Because I think it can be hard. Now it can be advice for either the patients or for the people who, um, who want to help, right? So like one would be, be specific about how you want to help, you know, not, oh, let me know how I can help, but maybe I'm going to bring by some food or, or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, as far as for the patients, I would say, yeah, just like ask for help when you need it. Like you don't have to do it. Like it's okay to ask somebody to do your laundry for you, to clean your house for you, to bring your food. Like you just have to let your guard down and realize that this is a time in your life that you do need help and it's okay to ask for help. And there are people that love you and care about you and that do genuinely want to help you from the bottom of your heart. You're not asking for too much. You're not being needy. Like you need this right now and just accept it. Um, and as for like, caretakers, I know lots of people have reached out to me asking, hey, like you've gone through this. I know someone who's going through it, but I don't know how to help them. Like, what do I do? So you can always reach out. Oh, and this is for someone who's going through cancer too. talk to somebody who has gone through something like that. So it can be help, helpful for both parties to be able to like relate and talk to someone like that. But yeah, like um, be specific about how you want to help them. If you're trying to be a caretaker, don't overdo it. Like if they say that they're okay and they need their space, like just kind of go with how they feel because it's super weird. One day you wake up and you feel fine. And then the next day you wake up and you feel awful. But then the third day you'll wake up and you'll feel fine as well. So just kind of play it by their books. Um, ask them what they want. A, lo a big thing that I say is if they have children, they care about their children more than they care about themselves. So help the children, you know, offer to like look after them or bring them something to distract them, stuff like that. Just like even the small things really like drop off a meal that means the world to them. So really it's just like how you think you can help them out the best that they can. But again, don't overdo it because that's also overwhelming. Perfectly um, said really, because there's a balance there. And I think you highlighted that balance. Um, so I just have a few more questions and then I'd like to open it up to you for anything else you want to really emphasize. Uh, one you did um, mention, which was uh, talk of fertility preservation, which your oncologist, I think, had brought up. What was that discussion? And then, um, you know, how did you think about whether it was right for you? Unfortunately, I, it wasn't really an option for me just because of we needed to start chemo right away and I don't know much about the preservation but I know it's like a month long process I think or like at least a few weeks so we didn't have time she basically was like I'm sorry but like that's not an option for you um however though she did kind of assure me that since I was um sorry since my tumor was up here the chemo was going to be more centered up here rather than kind of where my reproductive system is so she said that the chances are like hi that there would be either minimal or no damage she's like obviously i can't promise anything um but i was able to maintain a period throughout my whole treatment which is amazing and a good sign um as far as like whether i'm fertile or not i haven't really looked into it i'm not planning on having children anytime soon so for me it's kind of like a we'll cross that bridge when we get there um but i definitely would have loved to be able to do that just because i know that it would obviously be peace of mind and um that was a huge concern and worry of mine but again that's something that i kind of just had to put in the back of my mind and say you know what there's other options out there and I have to do chemo I don't really have a choice and if it's spreading aggressively like it might not be worth it to wait if that weight makes my cancer a whole lot worse um, so yeah that's just kind of what I had to do I mean it makes perfect sense because you have to take care of you first I think mm -hmm. that's like the ultimate message right whatever that means for people um, did you did you take the Lupron shot um, okay so what this I think is bringing up is the fact that, you know, you had to tackle all of these decisions as such a young person, a young adult. Mm -hmm. So 
for you, and I know you already mentioned, um, you know, you wanted to share your story with the world because you hadn't seen a lot of faces like yours. What was it like going through cancer so young and how has it shifted your perspective on life being so young, having gone through something so traumatic already? Um, I'm a strong believer in everything happens for a reason. And even with this, I think it happened for a reason. I think that it definitely showed me a lot in life. It taught me an incredible amount of lessons. Otherwise, it opened up my mind to so many things. Um, having been through cancer, I definitely made a lot of switches in my life. Um, healthy lifestyle, um, just being more active, more conscious of how bad the foods that we do eat are, um, what are better options for that. So everyone that I meet now, I'm like, oh, you should be eating this, so you shouldn't be eating this. Um, enjoying life more. I realized that what's the point of working and having money when you don't have your health? That's one thing that I learned and it was a discussion I had with my boyfriend. He's like, no matter what, how much money we had in the world, it wouldn't make your cancer go away any faster. And that's a very important lesson because I know lots of people just work and work and that's how I was before. I would miss out on weekends. I wouldn't take trips. I would pick up all the extra shifts just to have money or just to, you know, feel like I was moving forward in life. But so many experiences that I missed out on and I can't go back on. And I was like, what if, you know, what if I never had the opportunity to go through those experiences? Um, definitely helped me filter out people in my life. There were a lot of people that showed up when I had cancer and were my best friend. And then a few treatments in, they were nowhere to be found or people that, you know, never checked in. And so it kind of helps you filter out people. And it, honestly, as much of a negative situation as it was, it brought a lot of positivity into my life. It taught me how to be positive, how to be thankful for the little things, um, enjoy life, enjoy the people you have around you, and just really to value your health because health is wealth. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Well said. Um, it's, it's kind of incredible, all the lessons that you just listed that really were a result of having gone through this. And I'm so glad that you um, found all of the silver linings, you know, um, and have the rest of your life now to have those lessons to, to live by, which is awesome. Um, my last question is, I guess, maybe on the note of survivorship, um, you know, I know you still go through the scans and uh, cancer treatment is done, maybe cancer itself is is not like officially finished for a lot of people after treatment. It's part of your life. You determine how much of it is in your life. Um, how has it been for you, I guess? And do you still have um, anxieties about it? If you do, how do you work through it? I guess just really talk about the mental um, part of what, what this journey's meant to you. Yeah, so I always say that cancer, like half the battle with cancer is with what goes on in your head because your head goes to some absolutely terrible places while you're going through treatment. All the what ifs, all the like, am I a burden and should I even be asking the people for help or is this even worth it? And it's a really tough mental game. Positivity and positive mindset um, really did help me get through all of this. Um, and I know that that doesn't work for a lot of people and I respect that. But for me, that is truly what got me through it. Just seeing the silver lining, seeing the half, glass half full rather than half empty. Um, as far as survivorship goes, uh, at first I did find it really hard. I was like, you know what, like I'm not having treatment. Cause when you go to the hospital and you get treatment, someone's checking up on you every so often, right? But if you don't, you, then no one's really checking up on you and you don't know. And then you'll feel a random pain and you'll just be like, oh my goodness, is this just a random pain? Or is my cancer back? Every time I have a cough, I'm like, is this the tumor or am I just coughing? So that was definitely really hard for me at first. Um, definitely thought about it a lot. I thought about relapse a lot, especially because I was on social media so much. I followed a lot of people like that. And unfortunately, lots of people relapse. Lots of people pass away. I've had a few people that I became really good friends with on social media who have passed away. And even though I never met them, I shared a lot with them. So it is like losing a friend and it's really hard on you. And then it brings on those emotions onto yourself saying, you know, if it happened to them, it can happen to me. Um, but I did find that with time, it got better. Um, Honestly, on a day to day, I don't think about it. I very rarely talk about it. Um, although I do still carry on social media kind of around cancer, not as much. I try to focus it on other stuff now, but 
I mean, it's possible, but I just have trust that I live in a good country with a good medical system. Um, I can just make a phone call to the hospital and they will let me have a scan and I am in good hands. And if anything were to happen, like there's, I have options. There's always something that I can do. And that's just a part of life. Um, and just really learning to not let it consume me for the rest of my life. I think I find now that I try to just steer away from, you know, being a cancer survivor and having had cancer. Like, it's weird because everyone that knew me before knew, knows I had cancer, but then it's like you meet new people and that's not something you really want to say. Like, you know, like I had cancer. Um, so it's kind of been a good feeling realizing that I don't think about it as often anymore. And when people tell me, like when they just finished treatment, they're like, how do you get over it? I just say, you know what, with time, you start to go back to your normal life. You feel good. You see the hair grow back. Um, is like your scans are good. So you just kind of feel like you're good. You know, you're in the clear. And as long as you keep doing what you're doing, you'll be fine. I love that. What I'm hearing from you is also that you're really living in the present. It's mm -hmm. not too much of the worrying about the past or about the future even. So I love that. Um, is there any last thing you want to say that you feel is important for um, a bunch of diff different people watch this? It's, it's patients, new patients. It's, you know, uh, caregivers and it's just people who are like in that sort of bubble of oh I know someone who's going through this so any any message you have um one kind of thing that I would say is know that everyone's journey is much different so just because you know treatment didn't work for you or treatment didn't work for someone else doesn't mean that it's going to be the opposite way for you um because like you know some people's treatment plans are different some people like all the doctors treat differently all the drugs are different like depending where you are in the world so just don't be worried if what you are getting or what's going on with you isn't the same as somebody else on the internet who had the same cancer because everyone's bodies are different right like even though we had the same cancer, if we were at different ages, our bodies handled them differently and stuff like that. So I just think like, I really did a lot of research while I was sick. I tried to learn as much as I could about what my cancer was, what the effects of treatments were, how I can prevent them, how I can be healthier. And I think that that for me, kind of we talked about it earlier, but it was like a sense of control. Like I knew what was going on and that's how I feel calm when I kind of can grasp what's happening to me. So I did a lot of research and I just think that like, if you know what's going on with you, then you're better prepared when you go for these different um, appointments. And when there's different terms being like kind of tossed around, you kind of know what you're there talking about. It definitely helps you feel less anxious and more in control. Um, so yeah, that just those two things, like just know that everyone's different, but also like if you feel like that, then do your research and kind of understand what's happening. Great. I love those tips for people. Um, I think the more information from someone who's gone through it already, mm -hmm. the better, right? It may or may not work, but it's, it's information, which is empowering. Um, so thank you so much. You are such a great energy. I can see why you have the YouTube channel and are on social media talking to people. Um, excited to get your story up and also very happy that you're now part of our the patient story um, community so thanks so much for joining us today meg thank you for having me